Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us here, and welcome to the first post-lunch media briefing of the World Economic Forum on Africa 2015. Welcome also to our audience watching this live online at weforum.org. Now, the purpose of this press conference is a, a subject which is synonymous with the work of the forum. It's also a very uh, popular subject um, when it comes to the public engagement side of our work. It's, uh, it's always topical and it's always, it's always sure to fire debate in the countries of which we measure competitiveness. The Africa Competitiveness Report, of course, is building on the Global Competitiveness Report, which the forum produces every year. It's, a, it's, a, it's an opportunity to take the numbers and the data from that report and, and create a deeper analysis and uh, with a view of identifying areas for prioritization and for focus in order to drive competitiveness in the region. That's enough for me. I want to just briefly introduce my panel before asking them to make a few remarks, and hopefully we'll have plenty of time for questions. First on my, uh, my immediate left is Caroline Galvan, my colleague of the World Economic Forum and the, one of the lead authors of this report from the forum. Jennifer Mbazi Mbazi is the principal research economist at the Africa Development Bank. Anibal Gonzalez, Senior Trade and Competitiveness Director at the World Bank. Carlos Cordy, Head, Middle East and Africa, Global Relations Secretariat at the OECD. I'm going to ask my colleague Caroline first to give us a broad overview of the report, and then I'll ask each of the other um, guests here to discuss their particular chapters, then those being agricultural productivity, driving, a, driving the services sector, and injecting African business more into regional and global value chains. Caroline, over to you. Africa Competitiveness Report together with our four organizations, the African Development Bank, the World Bank, and the OECD. We're not hearing you. Okay, try now. This is the fifth Africa Competitiveness Report that brings together our four organizations, the African Development Bank, the World Bank, and the OECD. Every two years, we explore what needs to be done to improve Africa's competitiveness. And by competitiveness, we mean the set of institutions, policies, and factors that determine the level of productivity of an economy. Yes, now, so. this in turn will set the sustainable levels of prosperity that can be earned by an economy. Despite the very high economic growth rates that we have been seeing in the region over the past decade and more, we are seeing that competitiveness has been stagnating or even falling in some of the economies. And indeed, when we look at the sectors of the economy, ranging from agriculture, manufacturing, and the services sector, we are seeing that productivity has been low uh, and even stagnating. Now, these low numbers are partly a result of ongoing weaknesses when it comes to the basic drivers of competitiveness. So institutions, uh, both public and private, infrastructure, uh, and very critically, low levels of health and education. Now, on the other hand, we are seeing that many of the African economies are doing re relatively better in the more complex areas of competitiveness. So in the goods market, we have been seeing many reforms over the past years to enable a, a business environment, as well as the labor market. One of the key messages of the report is, however, that shifting labor across low product productive uh, activities is not going to be the solution. Instead, two things will be needed. It will be needed to ensure the employability of the workforce, and second of all, to create the gainful employment opportunities that will be needed for the very rapidly growing labor force going forward. This is why in this year's report, we explore jointly of what is needed to transform Africa's economies by looking at the agriculture sector, the services sector, as well as the potential to leverage regional and global value chains. We are seeing on one hand, a, or we have been seeing over the past decades, a declining agriculture sector, both in terms of value added and employment, although it provides income still for a very significant part of the population. But on the other hand, we are seeing a very rapidly rising services sector, all the while manufacturing has been remaining minimal. Now, in terms of regional competitiveness, we continue to see a regional divide ranging from Mauritius being the most competitive economy at 39th place to Guinea ranking 144th. With the exception of Mauritius, we are seeing that many of the middle income economies in the region have been stagnating in terms of competitiveness. 
And similarly, we are seeing that many of the resource-rich economies in the region, ranging from oil exporters to mineral exporters, are really at the bottom end of the global competitiveness ranking. On the upside, we have been seeing over the past years an improvement in competitiveness, uh, from a, albeit from a very low base, in the low-income economies uh, in the region. So what will be needed to go forward to improve productivity in all of these sectors is to get the basics right. So again, it is institutions, uh, both public and private, it is infrastructure, the transport and ICT infrastructure, as well as, uh, very critically, health and ensuring the right quality of education. In addition, it will be very critical to facilitate trade and to adv advance regional integration. And by addressing all of these basic requirements for competitiveness, really multiple gains can be reached to increase the productivity across all the sectors, agriculture, services, and manufacturing. And I would like to hand over to Jennifer Moyo to speak about agriculture. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, African Development Bank is indeed delighted to be part of um, this collaborative effort and to participate in this discussion today. Uh, Caroline highlighted the stagnating um, agriculture sector. It still remains a mainstay um, in Africa, um, counting for about 50% of employment. Indeed, any agriculture development strategy has to take account of the specific nature of agriculture in Africa which is dominated largely by smallholder farmers, accounting for about 80%. We discussed several issues in the chapter, but I'll highlight just three areas here today. First, the role of information communication technology, then the place of rural infrastructure, this has indeed the potential to revolutionize um, the agriculture sector. ICT can be used across the production cycle, right from <clears throat> pre-cultivation to inform choices about crop and land selection, to inform choices of um, crop insurance. It can also be used during uh, crop cultivation by providing information on the right amount of fertilizer and the type of fertilizer to be used, as well as providing information on crop health. It can be used during the post-harvest period to be able to communicate prices to farmers and be able to enhance um, price discovery. Moving over to rural infrastructure, agriculture losses within Africa account for 30%. So it's imperative that these losses are stemmed. And we can do this through ensuring that farm produce moves quickly from the farm to the market. And so this is through rural feeder roads, connecting with national and regional uh, road networks. In addition, it's imperative that you have um, storage enhanced so that the farmers can be able to get good prices within and out of season. Also within rural infrastructure, irrigation systems are key because in, in Africa, um, there's only 4% of agriculture is irrigated. This is considerably lower than other regions of the world. And research has shown that irrigation increases productivity by up to 90%. So this is imperative. Moving down to value chains, uh, it's important that um, there's um, an integration of the farmers into the agriculture value chains, both at a regional level and into global value chains. But this is a, an area that will be touched on further. But again, within the smallholder farmers, it's imperative that they are better organized in cooperatives so that they can be able to have a bargaining power and be able to access uh, finance. And then also, once they're organized, they can be able to link better with commercial farmers through outgrower schemes, which are contract farming. And so not only increasing productivity and competitiveness, but also ensuring that agriculture development is inclusive. Thank you. Annabelle. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm also very pleased uh, um, and on, the, uh, on behalf of the World Bank Group uh, to be participating in this effort to produce uh, the African Competitiveness uh, Report. Um, the increasingly important role of services in economies ac across Africa is challenging long-held theories of uh, structural transformation, which, as we know, for decades have basically been saying that the typical path out of poverty was increased agricultural productivity followed by growth in manufacturing. 
Today, however, structural transformation in Africa is proceeding along a different trajectory. In many countries across the region, services are the most rapid, rapidly growing sector, creating new jobs and economic activities, and providing critical inputs to boost productivity production in other sectors. Now, services exports are also growing in Africa. While direct exports from the region remain a relatively small portion of overall exports, services play a very large indirect role as inputs into exports of primary, primary goods and manufacturing. Now, despite a strong growth in the sector, the productivity of services is low. Employment of services is growing much faster than the services share of GDP. Growth in this area is, low, uh, is in low productivity sectors, such as personal and government services, and not in high productivity ones, such as business services or finance. As a result, the services sector is becoming increasingly relevant in the development agenda across Africa. As countries continue to seize the opportunities in the services sector, policymakers and economists need to research a number of new issues, such as what are the barriers that exist to creating a more productive service sector in Africa? What are the links between a growing services sector and poverty reduction in Africa? How can the services sector make a significant impact on creating employment opportunities for Africa's rapidly growing labor force? How can services become a more dynamic export sector for Africa? Or what role can services play in developing Africa's participation in global value chains? So the World Bank Group research shows that to maximize gains from trading services, most governments in the region need to reduce direct barriers to trade in services, as well as to reduce indirect barriers that result from poor regulation. Barriers to trade in services often are more complicated than barriers to trade in goods. For most services sectors, governments must lower trade barriers as well as enact these complementary regulatory reforms to develop a more competitive services sector. These reforms are also necessary for Africa to deepen its integration into global value chains, to increase competitiveness, and to achieve important social and developmental objectives. Now, some African countries, such as Mauritius, Senegal, and Tunisia, have implemented policies to create a more enabling business environment for services exports. And these countries currently enjoy uh, exports at a much higher level of services than most other countries at their level of development. So for instance, if we look at Mauritius, Mauritius is performing well in exports of business services, finance, and transport. The same group, for example, a leader in the financial sector, uh, is a case in point. Senegal does well in business services, communications, and finance. Premium Contact Center International, a provider of call, cell, uh, call center services, again illustrates this point. And Tunisia is also doing well in communication, distribution, and transport services exports. And here, for example, TTS Group, a leader in the tourism and transport sector, uh, is a good example. Now, the World Bank Group is assisting countries across Africa as they seek to become more competitive in trading services. There is much to be done, from invest investing in development and human capital, infrastructure and ICT, to advising on policy reform. We are committed to helping African economies realize their potential in trading services and to ensure that the growth of services exports facilitates inclusive growth and poverty reduction. Thank you. Carlos. <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you. Uh, in the OECD, we are delighted of participating again with uh, these important partners in the publication of the African Competitiveness Report. And in this occasion, uh, we have worked on the area of global value chains, which offer an important opportunity to African countries to better integrate the global economy. You know that the global value chains is a reflection of the current phase of globalization and reflects the fragmentation of the production. And there is increasing evidence that the effect in developing countries can be very positive. There are opportunities in the global, in the global value chains that allow countries to engage in production processes with a low uh, level of initial investment. 
uh, the barriers to enter the global economy become uh, lower with the global value chains and it provides access to capitals, to technology, uh, to global markets. Uh, of course, the question is how to favor that this uh, integration is uh, better and is transformed also in social outcomes. Uh, then, uh, when you analyze the global value chains, and this is what we are uh, showing in this chapter, you see that there is a variety of policies that have an impact on how to better integrate in the global value chains. Traditionally, the focus has been very much uh, put on trade policies, investment, uh, investment policies, which is, of course, uh, very important. Uh, but there are other elements that also uh, matter very much. Removing barriers, uh, physical barriers, uh, by improving infrastructures or logistics, for example, is something very important. But also all the uh, barriers related to governance issues, like uh, cutting uh, red tape, for example. Uh, when talking with the private sector, and yesterday we had a very interesting session on global value chains with representatives from the private sector, I have to say that the governance factors were very much underlined by the private sector. I mean, when the companies want to invest in this type of uh, production systems, they think very much in the predictability, and on that, the uh, soundness and the uh, quality of the institutions uh, matter very much. Then, of course, the question is how to be proactive and what uh, governments can do to improve the uh, participation in the global value chains. And, of course, uh, this is a difficult question when we are talking about an area that is defined by multidimensionality and, therefore, the need of, prior, prior, uh, of priorities, of setting priorities on what are the policies that have to be uh, reformed. Of course, the political economy of reform is uh, something uh, very important, and when you have to prioritize, you have to manage and to have good governance systems uh, to tackle the different uh, set of policy reforms that are necessary. Uh, on that, uh, it's important to think in these uh, governance aspects. Uh, we consider that uh, countries have to make an effort to set uh, strategic planning systems, uh, to set multidimensional objectives in the different policy areas that uh, matter. Uh, method is very important, and on this uh, we have also to consider that the global value chains are not created by governments, but uh, it's of course uh, the private sector to decide to invest and to engage in the system of production. And that the dialogue and the collaboration with the private sector we consider is essential, uh, but also the multilateral uh, dialogue and collaboration between countries. There are good experiences that, that the transfer of good practices and the uh, multilateral collaboration can provide countries with uh, good examples and uh, can be very inspirational to, to have an impact. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, get a quick show of hands, please, for who wants to ask questions. Okay, so get a microphone down here to the lady in the front. We'll take these four. We have plenty of time. Should be working. Okay. Uh, Linda Insall from Business Day. If you could just explain to me how you measure competitiveness and against what, and what happens if competitiveness uh, doesn't improve? What happens to an economy? And how does South Africa fare in your um, tablings? Thanks. Caroline, one for you. We equate competitiveness very much with productivity. So we look at the drivers of productivity, ranging from the more basic, such as institutions, infrastructure, and education, to the more complex such as market efficiencies or the capacity of economies to innovate. Um, when we look at uh, South Africa, we are seeing it's ranking 56th in the ranking. Uh, it rates the second most competitive economy on the continent. It does, um, as many other African economies, relatively well in the goods market, um, also in the financial market and innovation, but it really critically um, needs to improve its education. So education is, I think, the, the key message of the report is education across all African economies needs to improve. Okay. Uh, lady at the uh, fourth row back, if you still want to ask a question. Take but can I just ask, um, do you repeat that about South Africa being 56th? So I just missed a little bit of what you were saying. So Thank Afri you. So Africa, South Africa ranks 56th out of 144 economies in the Global Competitiveness Index. Okay, right, we had a couple of people at the front, Eleni and Stuart. 
Hi, very good afternoon. Um, I'm really concerned about your comments with regards to uh, productivity stagnating, um, as well as it being relatively low. Do you think that this is going to risk um, Africa's competitiveness on, the, on a global stage? And are we sitting in a dangerous uh, situation, do you think, with regards to productivity? Um, so competitiveness is for us is productivity. We equate it with productivity. So one one being low meaning the other being low. And um, yes, uh, I think we can be concerned. On one hand, we are seeing a lot of improvements on the continent in terms of ICT, in terms of macroeconomic stability, goods market. But uh, again, the key message of the report really being that you need to get the basics right. Um, so again, infrastructure, institutions, and education. And those are areas that take a long time to, to improve, so I think now is the time to make those investments. Okay, uh, microphone over here. Any other comments on that one? It's an interesting, it's an interesting question. Can you be an Afro-optimist and still look at stagnating productivity across the region? Okay, moving on to Stuart. Remind us where you're from, Stuart, and uh, who you're sure. writing for. Sure. Yes, a very good afternoon to all the panelists. I'm Stuart Lee Sulo, uh, senior business reporter uh, for the Post newspapers based in Lusaka, Zambia. Very interesting. Uh, I just wanted to pose a couple of questions here, Oliver. Um, with regards to Zambia, how does one interpret how competitive Zambia is in this report? And uh, secondly, uh, it's common knowledge that uh, Zambia's uh, mining sector really is uh, the mainstay of the country's economy. Um, but we've seen in recent years that uh, the agriculture sector does have an awful lot of potential. So my question really is, how effectively do you think uh, the agricultural sector is being exploited uh, to advance Zambia's uh, economy? Thank you. So maybe, Caroline, you could talk a little bit. And Jennifer, would you perhaps uh, offer some comments on how well agriculture is being exploited? Caroline first. So, and Zambia ranks 96th in our ranking, and um, you mentioned the mining sector. I think the key message of the report is diversification. So it is on one hand uh, raising productivity in agriculture that Je uh, Jennifer will speak to, but um, on the other hand is really working on the, on the other areas. So I think one sector is not enough, it is to raise productivity across all sectors. Okay, we're going to take a question here from the lady right at the far. Oh, sorry, Jennifer, you were going to, okay. I keep getting distracted by your waving. We'll come to you very soon. Jennifer, agricultural okay. productivity. On agricultural productivity in Zambia, um, I would say, as you said, um, mining still remains a mainstay, and it's indeed uh, key that um, Lusaka does, I mean, Zambia does diversify. And I would say that uh, more remains to be done, particularly in terms of um, agricultural research and, and development uh, within Zambia, and also just being able to spend more on, on development, because across um, the continent, um, the expenditure on, on research and development still remains now, so Zambia mm -hmm. can do more on that, as well as um, in the areas of uh, land tenure and reforming land systems, so that um, the farmers are able to have a security of tenure for the land and be able to access, um, uh, access. So more could be done in order to broaden the gains from, from growth, from agriculture. Great, okay, lovely to see so many hands. Okay, what we're going to do, we're going to sweep across the room. So, lady there, lady there, lady there, and these two gentlemen here. Maybe we can have a human chain with a microphone. Let's start with you on the, on the far right. Claire Bissaka, Financial Mail. You said that Africa's development was following an unusual pattern in that um, the manufacturing sector was stagnant, but the services sector was taking off, um, and that was, that was unexpected. Could you explain why you think that is happening, and also whether that is a good or a bad thing? Thank you very much uh, for your question. Um, this is exactly one of the key findings of, uh, of our report, which is the growth in the services sector. And uh, one of the things that uh, we, we identify is that uh, in many of the countries, this growth has been happening in uh, some of the sectors that have the lowest productivity, as I was mentioning, personal services and government services. Uh, so I think the key message that comes out of this uh, chapter is that uh, governments um, need to exploit this opportunity by adopting reforms both to allow for the participation of foreign direct investment in a number of services sectors, but also for strengthening the regulatory framework of these uh, services. Uh, this presents a huge opportunity for African countries uh, to move into services uh, that are of higher productivity. And the examples that I mentioned, for instance, in um, 
uh, in countries uh, like uh, Senegal uh, or Tunisia uh, show that, uh, uh, that countries in the region have already uh, begun to take advantage of these opportunities. But again, uh, this uh, more needs to be done. At a broader level, this connects, of course, con uh, with the other elements uh, that Caroline was mentioning uh, about the need to improve uh, uh, human capital, uh, infrastructure, and institutions, uh, again, as uh, key uh, uh, factors uh, that will drive growth in the uh, high productivity services sectors. Okay, lady then. I'm Kim Clusey, freelance journalist um, for engineering news here at the WEF. Um, I'd just like to know, have there been any radical shifts in, you know, quite serious shifts in countries that have maybe dropped quite substantially compared to last year? And I'm sure it's on, it is online, I would imagine, yeah. now. But what are the worst performing countries, just sort of the last five, the bottom five? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Caroline. For the worst performing countries in many of the resource-rich economies, so Guinea is closing the ranking uh, at 144th place. We also have um, Angola, Mauritania, and, and Chad. Uh, top in Africa is Mauritius, ranking 39th, and South Africa coming in at 56th place. Any significant movements in the ranking or, or trends that you've been able to discern? So we have been, so unfortunately, competitiveness overall has been stagnating. Uh, we are seeing, however, on one hand, that Mauritius has rapidly improved its competitiveness over the past years. Uh, it superseded South Africa actually last year and is now Africa's most competitive economy in, in the region. Okay, uh, the lady there right in the middle. Thank you. Uh, my name is Victoria. Tafmane Rujizo uh, from Zimbabwe. Uh, Zimbabwe has largely been an agro-based economy, but I've seen the mining sector also taking a center stage. From your perspective, from your research, where does our economy stand? Um, so Zimbabwe is ranking 124th uh, out of 144, to remind you, and, and, and it's, it's, it's very low, 124th out of 144. Um, ranking very low, so there is going to be uh, improvements needed across all areas. And, and again, to reiterate, it is to get the basics right. If you start from the basics, institutions, infrastructure, education, and you can get very far. Uh, sorry, just to follow up on education. We are one of the most literate in uh, Africa. So what do you mean uh, we have to get our education right? I just need your guidance there. So it is education in terms of what is needed. Um, so what does the business sector need? Um, so you can have very high attainment rates, but it's very crit critically also the quality of the education, providing the skills that are needed to be a competitive economy. Great. Rattling through, through these questions, I've got a feeling we'll have a few more after we officially um, formally close. But um, time for two more, I'd say. Gentlemen, front row. All right. Uh, this question is really just about uh, the drought that seems to be hitting South Africa and, and other parts of Africa. Now, you spoke about irrigation. Where does, where does something like drought feed in? Because that doesn't, you can't really solve that, that kind of problem. And how does that, do you guys take that into consideration when you write your reports and, and how that could affect growth, especially in the agriculture sector? So this is a climate change no, question? No, more just the, the there's a, there is a bit of a drought, okay. quite a hectic drought happening. So from that well, Caroline, um, we look quite a long way into the distance, but of course you have to take into account emerging trends. Any comments there? Uh, again, um, I think Jennifer mentioned the, the very low irrigation uh, on the continent. So, um, you know, it will be very difficult to, to combat climate change as such, but you can definitely increase your resilience to climate change. And irrigation, I think, is a very low hanging fruit. Um, Jennifer mentioned 4% of the region is irrigated compared, I, I believe, to 35% in India and, and more in Asia. So I think that's, uh, that's one of the things that can be done within the next years. Any comments, Jennifer? Uh, just, to, uh, just emphasize, yeah, I think it's, it's the same uh, point about... Um, more irrigation required. Irrigation. Exactly. Okay. I, I think we only have to have one more question, unfortunately, but these, uh, our panelists will be available. The lady um, right there in the third row has had her hand up a lot, so over to you, madam. Okay. I just, um, I'd like to get in from SABC. Uh, there are uh, economies that are really doing well on the continent, countries like mm -hmm. Mozambique growing at 7%. I'm just trying to figure out if there is a direct link between a growing economy and competitiveness because mm -hmm. I don't see them mentioned in any of the top countries uh, in terms of competitiveness and they are the countries that are growing at uh, regions of 7% in terms of the economy. And really I'm looking at your report also saying this is like deja vu. You've been saying this since uh, 
1998. So is nobody listening? A good question. Yeah. So uh, there, I believe there's growth and growth. So it's indeed we have been seeing very high growth rates over the past decade. Our message is that what we want to look at is what are the sustainable growth levels? You know, what are the sustainable levels of, for prosperity? Uh, and again, here in terms of competitiveness, it's very low. So we are saying there's a difference between high economic growth but very low competitiveness. So in order to have long-term sustained growth, we need to improve competitiveness. And it's a, uh, over a narrative, of course, it's a, it's, a, it's a very good point. So we're seeing stagnation since 1998 or, or, or however, but there are also bright spots. Any, any trends in competitiveness? Any areas where you, you've seen improvements over that time? Uh, yeah, very critically um, in the goods market efficiency. So we are seeing that uh, actually a lot of sub-Saharan African economies are doing very well in doing business. So the World Bank's doing business report very rapidly in uh, reforming economies, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Kenya, etc. So those are one of the trends. We also see that over the past decade, macroeconomic stability has been improving. So yeah, so these are the two, two, two main trends in terms of going up. And just to close, let's just maybe we could all offer a suggestion because we like to think that you know, there is some positive um, progress being made. Perhaps we could all offer you know, one example of, of how we're seeing positive progress towards better competitiveness. Annabelle, let's start with you. If I, yeah, if I may, I think that uh, in the context of declining commodity prices, uh, uh, structural transformation uh, will come to the forefront of the agenda of many of many African countries, and in particularly in the area of services that uh, is uh, the area that we uh, specialize in the in the report. Uh, the potential for African countries is is very large. Uh, as I was mentioning, several African countries are already exploiting uh, the opportunities generated by the services sector. Uh, the case of Mauritius is a very important case in point. Other African countries can also follow this route. It's important to address uh, barriers uh, to the growth of trade and services by um, uh, uh, allowing uh, foreign participation in the services sector as a way of bringing in uh, innovation, know-how, technology, uh, but also to uh, strengthen the regulatory environment, the regulatory framework uh, in each of the services sectors. Okay. Carlos, anything to add on value chains? Uh, yes, I would like to say that it's very important <coughs> to work on data and improving the evidence, uh, in the sense that in, to advise uh, good policies and for the countries to know what are the comparative advantages uh, from which they can get more benefits by integrating in the, in, in the value chains, uh, we need uh, data and evidence. We are developing the trading added value database that uh, incorporates already more than 50 countries, only South Africa in sub-Saharan Africa, but it really allows to make a very fair assessment of what is the interaction between imports and exports in 18 industries, and then this provides very good uh, advice to the countries on how to position themselves to take more advantage from this. Jennifer, where have you seen most progress, and what would you like to see changed in the coming year? On the agriculture side, I would probably say um, progress perhaps needs to be uh, continue to be made on research and development. We have some success stories in research and development in terms of um, staple um, food crops. Uh, we've seen developments in maize, new varieties of rice. Um, you know, and beans, and so there's more that can be done there. And ICT, I think already as a continent, it's already being used um, quite considerably, but more could be done. It could be harnessed better for greater uh, competitiveness and productivity. Thank you very much. Now we have uh, over, over gone our time. I'm, I'm, I think the panelists will be around for one-on-ones if you want to grab them afterwards, but thank you very all very much for joining us today. Thank you online for watching. This conference is now closed.